All right, we're recording. Is it true that you talked your way into business school? Yes, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> I had terrible grades my first two years of college. And so I basically had to uh, sit down with, I guess, my uh, advisor, academic advisor, really do some some uh, convincing, negotiating, I guess. Um, and there was this business statistics class that I had failed twice and it was a prerequisite for business school. So not only had it drug my GPA down, but it was like you had to have a passing grade in that class to get into business school. And uh, my GPA was at a point where the only way they were going to let me into business school was if I made an A plus in that class. And so I ended up with that class Monday, Wednesday, Fridays at 8 a.m., and I mean, I just had to buckle down. I made sure I was sitting there in the front row every single class and, and I barely pulled off the, the grade that I needed to get in. So, but I don't think I was supposed to have even been allowed to take that class a third time. Uh, so I guess that's where the convincing took place was just to give me a shot. Let me take the class again. And then it was up to me to just put in the work and deliver. All right. Well, it worked out because you ended up graduating few detours, you know, I remember you said you delivered furniture for a while. I think everyone's worked those kinds of odd jobs. I bet that probably convinced you like, all right, like blue collar labor, not that there's anything wrong with it, but maybe driving all over the East Coast delivering furniture to people probably wasn't uh, the best use of your time. Yeah, it was eye opening for me, I think. So I got out of school in 2009. And you know, for those that remember kind of what was going on in the economy, it was not a good time to be graduating, even with a business degree, there just weren't that many companies out there uh, looking to hire, you know, a kid out of college with no real world experience. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I kind of dabbled around. I had worked at a hotel resort uh, part time while I was in college. So I kind of did that full time for a little bit. And then uh, a buddy of mine, his dad owned a logistics company and they just signed a contract with lazy boy to deliver furniture for them, as you said, up and down the East coast. And so it, it was something different, right? It got me out of the hotel. Uh, this taught me a very valuable lesson, even outside of the fact that I knew I didn't really want to do manual labor for the rest of my life. Cause that was a hard job. I mean, you're in a truck all day and then you're carrying big furniture into people's houses, trying to make sure you're not scratching the walls or, messing up their floors. And, you know, a lot of times you're carrying like a lazy boy sofa up a narrow staircase to someone's room above their garage, just not, not very enjoyable work. But the way my buddy's dad presented the opportunity, it was me and one other guy that I worked at the hotel with. He said, look, this is going to be like three to four hour days, most days, you know, a handful of deliveries. And I'm just going to pay you guys a hundred dollars a day. And, and at the time it sounded pretty good. Right. And, what ended up happening was it turned into, you know, 12 to 13 hour days. We were usually getting to the truck around five, five thirty in the morning, driving three hours to make our first delivery and then working our way back up the coast, delivering furniture. And you weren't done until the truck was empty. Uh, so I learned a very valuable lesson, which was uh, how to value my time. And, you know, if I would have really, I don't think I ever actually did the math because it would have just been depressing, but, I was probably making like $4 an hour, uh, at a hundred dollars a day. So, um, but yeah, it, I mean, it, it, it kind of taught me that, uh, you know, I wanted to do something more where I could work with my mind and use my communication skills. And I think I always kind of had a knack for the strategy, uh, part of business, but I mean, I came into college wanting to be a physical therapist. So, you know, first couple semesters, I'm taking biology classes and, and it didn't take me very long to figure out that that's not really what I was cut out for. And so, uh, you know, business school seemed like the good way to go. Um, but definitely learned a lot through some of those early years in college and also some of the kind of odd jobs that I had along the way. So then the enterprise executive training program came along. I've heard yeah. a lot of different things from different people. And I think it depends what your, your, your background is, what, what you want to do. I know that for broad strokes purposes for you, it worked out pretty well. Yeah, it was great. So enterprise, they call it their management trainee program. And so, as I mentioned, got out of school 
you know, deep in a recession, not many companies looking to hire people out of college with no experience. Cause there was, I mean, unemployment was at an all time high. So you got people with years and years of real world experience, you know, in some cases people with MBAs applying for the same type of jobs that, you know, I was applying for right out of college. So obviously companies wanted to go with someone that had more experience. Enterprise was a little bit different because they had this management training program. And so their model is hire people right out of college. That's the one requirement that they had was that you had to have a college degree. They didn't care what the degree was in, but you had to have a four year degree to be eligible to apply. And this management training program was real world business school is kind of the way I think about it, but it's a grind and their model is a churn and burn model. They bring in a ton of people. Most of them don't make it more than six to 12 months because you're working long days. You're learning a, a lot about business because you're, you know, you're doing sales, you're doing a lot of communication with customers. So you learn a lot about customer service as you kind of work your way up in the company, you become an assistant manager and then a branch manager. And at that level, you know, you're managing your own location and you get paid largely off of the bottom line of the location. So you get some experience in managing profit and loss statements and controlling costs and maximizing revenue. Uh, you get some experience with, you know, hiring people and training and kind of building a culture within your branch, <clears throat> all good things, but most people don't make it to that level because it's just a lot of hard work and you're kind of working in the trenches. It's a very uh, customer centric uh, job. You've got literally clients in your face all day, but you're also cleaning cars, you're dropping people off, picking them up. I mean, there's just a lot that that's required of you and the pay is not, not great, right? So you, again, never wanted to do the calculation of what was I actually making per hour because it would have just been depressing. But I spent about three years with enterprise. I did work my way up into management. And, and I tell people, because I still get asked every now and then, you know, hey, I've got a, a son or a daughter that's looking at going to work for enterprise. What are your thoughts? And I, I tell people this, it's, it's a grind, it's hard work, but you will learn a ton from it. So when I look back at my experience working with enterprise, I'm very, very glad I did it. I'm also very, very glad I'm not still doing it. Um, and I, I know people that I worked at enterprise with that are still, still there, right? They're still kind of trying to climb that, that corporate ladder with a very large company like enterprise. And, and that was me for the first handful of years that I was working there. I was drinking the Kool-Aid. I was, you know, if you would have asked me a year in enterprise, Hey, you know, where would you like to be five years from now? I'd be like, man, I'd love to be an area manager for enterprise rent a car. You know, they're making like at least six figures. They get a company car and, you know, they don't really have to wash cars anymore. I mean, that, that was me. I was trying to, to climb that enterprise ladder. Um, and fortunately, at least for me, I uh, got exposed to some people that were very entrepreneurial minded and, you know, were looking at, at business in a different way than how I had been looking at it. And they just kind of exposed me to a whole way, whole nother way of going about it. And, and that's kind of, I guess, what set me down more of this entrepreneurial path. So now it's 11, 12 years later, we're in another economic recession of a very different kind, but it's a recession nonetheless. It's a very tough time for people who either have lost their jobs or are looking for jobs. You're on the other side of that now. Now you are a business owner. You have not just your consulting company path to freedom, but you and your wife also are franchise owners with Shelf Genie. How did you first become interested in franchising? And then how did you make the transition from being kind of on the executive side of it to being a franchisee yourself and now to kind of double dipping and being a consultant? Yeah. Well, fell completely backwards into franchising. Um, you know, and we, we talked about business school earlier. I've always kind of thought this was interesting, you know, to, in, in my memory, like franchising never got talked about in business school. And I think that's still largely the case. It's not something that you learn about in school as a business model or a way of doing business, whether it's, you know, through a company franchising and having franchisees or even, you know, becoming a franchisee is an option for uh, business ownership. Now that may have changed and I'd like to think that more schools are kind of talking about this, but you know, I was like most people 
uh, that I talk with now, if you mention franchising, the first thing that came to my mind was fast food restaurants, right? Uh, it's just never really something I'd considered. <clears throat> and when we moved back to Wilmington, after I'd been working for Enterprise for about three years, I knew I was kind of looking to, to change it up, looking for a new opportunity and just happened to get introduced to a couple of guys that had started a company based here in Wilmington. And uh, they had recently started franchising it. And it was not a food business at all. It was a company that does access and mobility equipment for primarily elderly people, but really anyone with some sort of a physical disability. They would install wheelchair ramps and stair lifts and anything to help people get in and out of their home safely if they had some sort of a, a disability. And, and they were franchising the business and they were relatively small at the time. I wanna say they had you know six or seven franchisees and again, not knowing anything about franchising, I met the founders, liked them, thought it was just interesting. It was something different from what I'd been doing. And they were looking to kind of grow their team at the Wilmington office. And they said, look, you know, I don't really know where this goes in terms of, you know, your ability to grow with the company, but we can tell you if you're good and if you work hard and if you're willing to learn, we're growing and there's going to be opportunity for you to grow with the company. So that's how I got into franchising. It certainly wasn't intentional. I didn't go seeking franchising, but as soon as I kind of landed in that job with that company, as I mentioned earlier, I've just all of a sudden I'm surrounded by people that are very entrepreneurial. They're building their own businesses. And one of the roles they put me in shortly after I started working there was franchise sales and development. So now I'm talking to people all across the country that are looking at this particular business as, as a business that they wanted to get involved in, or they were at least exploring it as a, as an opportunity. So, you know, I kind of got to learn what that process looks like, you know, how to help someone understand the business, figure out, you know, is it a good fit for them? Uh, what is it going to take on their part as a franchisee to be successful? How does the franchisor add value to them as a franchisee? Uh, and the, probably the biggest thing I learned through that process was it's really not a sales process. You know, good franchise companies are not looking to sell a franchise to just anyone. They're looking to partner with people that have a high likelihood of being successful in their business. And so that process I was taking people through was really more of a mutual evaluation. Sure, they were vetting the company. They had a lot of questions to get answered you know, for themselves, but it was also my responsibility to get to know these people and, and kind of get a sense of whether or not you know, we thought they would be successful as franchisees. Would they be a good culture fit? Would they represent the brand well? All of these things. And again, it just, I, I kept meeting more and more people that are you know, entrepreneurial, or we're at least looking to kind of make that transition out of corporate America uh, into business ownership. And again, just eye opening. Um, and that, you know, so I ended up working with that company for about four years, took on some some different roles and responsibilities, absolutely loved it. But I just kind of got to the point where there was nowhere, nowhere else for me to go in that company, I'd kind of hit a ceiling. Uh, and it's interesting. So Dave Pazgan, who was uh, the very first guest I interviewed on this podcast, now he's a great friend of mine, absolutely a mentor of mine. Um, he was the CEO of that company. And he had told me probably a year and a half into it, he would said, Wes, at some point, you'll outgrow this company. And I didn't, I didn't really know what he meant at that time and, and didn't really think a whole lot about it. But, you know, a couple of years later, I went to Dave and said, Hey, you probably don't even remember this, but at one point in time, you know, you told me that I'd outgrow this company. And I think I might be at that point. And, you know, Dave's the type of guy. And, and fortunately I had a good enough relationship to him where, you know, I could literally feel comfortable having this conversation because essentially I'm talking myself out of a job. Right. Uh, and he was great. He just said, okay, well, you know, what do you think you want to do next? And, and I'd had numerous roles within, uh, the company at that point gotten to try some different things. And I said, well, I, I'm fascinated with franchising. I can tell you, I, I want to stay in franchising somehow. And he said, okay, well, what have you enjoyed most out of all the different roles that you've had here? I said, well, I think I've really enjoyed the, the sales and development piece, you know, helping people understand the franchise opportunity and determine if it's a good investment for them. 
So Dave kind of tapped his network and reached out to people. He, he knew a lot of people involved in franchising. Uh, and that's what opened the door for me to go to Shelf Genie and kind of take over their franchise sales and, and development. And, and all along the way that this is happening, you know, business ownership is, is really growing in my mind in terms of something that, that I knew I wanted to get into. And, um, you know, Kelly and I got married and we're actually expecting our first child, our, our daughter, uh, Mackenzie, around the time that I went to work for Shelf Genie. And Kelly had been doing pharmaceutical sales. She actually got laid off uh, while she was out on maternity leave with McKinsey. Her company did a mass layoff and uh, she was caught up in that. So it kind of opened the door for us to really start thinking more seriously about getting into business for ourselves. And looking back on it now, it's, it's probably the best thing that could have happened to us professionally speaking because Kelly was already having some concerns about going back to work full time in pharmaceuticals, you know, we would have had to kind of put our daughter in daycare five days a week. So, you know, we were already starting to kick around some ideas of, you know, what could Kelly do that's a little more flexible would allow her to, you know, be at home, at least some, you know, with with our daughter, and get involved with Shelf Genie spent about a year helping other people get into that business. And so obviously, I, I learned the business inside and out. And it, it kind of just dawned on me one day, I said, Kelly, we need to, we need to buy the franchise here in the Wilmington area. And it, it happened to be available. They didn't have a franchisee in this area. So long story short, that's how we got into our first franchise business. Um, and uh, Kelly's taken the reins. She, she's kind of been the one that's, that's grown the business into what it is today. And, um, you know, we've, it, it's just kind of fueled that fire, right? And so now, uh, we have our Shelf Genie business. Shelf Genie has a spinoff company that does custom closets. So we're franchisees in that business. And Stu, I don't even know if you and I have had a chance to catch up on this, but uh, as of last week, we've just bought into our third franchise business, which is an insulation um, business. So uh, we'll be launching that in early 2021. But um, so that's kind of the the next venture uh, for us as, as franchisees ourselves. So um, I don't know, that was, that was long winded, but uh, hopefully that that kind of fills in some of the gaps in terms of my background and, and how we got involved in franchising in the first place and, and ultimately, you know, started owning our own franchise businesses. I think this would be a really good place to just kind of put the ad in because we're going to come out of that ad. <clears throat> and I was going to say, so, all right. So I mentioned a little bit ago that, you know, now we're in another economic recession, but you guys are a little more in the driver's seat than you would have been 11, 12 years ago, coming out of college, a lot of that because you do own your own business. So how would you say that franchising and being business owners has changed your life? Yeah, that's a good, good point And a good question. I mean, there's no doubt it's, it's changed our lives in a lot of ways. And, and I would say most of them very positive changes. I mean, you know, as you mentioned, it, it puts you in a little more of the driver's seat. And, and that's the case in good economic times and bad economic times. I mean, just because you own a business doesn't mean you're not susceptible to, uh, you know, things going on in the world, most recently COVID-19, right? I mean, that's impacted everyone, employees, business owners, whatever. Uh, but it gives you a lot more control. Um, you know, for us, we've really enjoyed the freedom and the flexibility. I mean, that's kind of where, you know, the whole concept of path to freedom came from is, you know, we have just absolutely loved having more control over our time and our schedules. And it doesn't mean that we don't work hard. It doesn't mean that we don't have to do things some days that we would prefer not to do, you know, that you're always going to have some of that, right. But, you know, we don't have to be at an office every single morning at the same time reporting to someone, you know, accounting for, you know, what we've done today, were we productive enough, you know, we answer to ourselves. And, you know, for us, for Kelly and I, the, the way we're wired, you know, we set a higher bar for ourselves than any boss could ever set for us, right? So, you know, I think that's helped us become a lot more uh, really just successful and productive in all aspects of our lives. And I also feel too that when you're building something that's yours, there's a lot more motivation and drive than when you're building something that doesn't belong to you 
right? So on the hard days, on the crappy days, it's easier to get up and, and get after it and make it happen when, when it's yours versus when it's someone else. I mean, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, you're still going to have the crap days, right? Uh, you're not going to ever get around that. But in my experience, at least the, the crap days are, are a lot better when, when you're doing it for you versus, you know, when you're literally feeling like you, you have to do it for someone else. Um, and, and as far as the, the, you know, kind of recession piece goes, I mean, obviously different businesses are impacted, uh, in different ways with, you know, whatever's going on in the economy. I mean, you know, using COVID-19 as an example, you know, if you owned a fitness franchise, you are probably impacted a lot differently than if you own, uh, you know, like a, a home service type business like we're involved in. Um, but at the end of the day, you do have a lot more control. Uh, you have more control over your livelihood. I think I've said this on the podcast before, but probably worth saying again, you know, when so many people as a result of COVID were getting laid off or furloughed or were laying awake at night worried about, you know, were they still going to have a job? You know, Kelly and I never had to have that conversation. We never had to say, hey, uh, do you think we should lay ourselves off? Like that, that's maybe an option. Well, they, that conversation didn't happen. Doesn't mean we weren't concerned. It just meant, you know, we had to sit down, we had to kind of assess the situation as best as we could. And we had to figure out, you know, where do we need to pivot? And what do we need to implement in our businesses to, to kind of weather this storm? And again, the type of business you're in, the industry you're in, that certainly plays a role in this, right? Um, but I mean, our, our business, our, our shelving and closet business is up 20% year over year uh, through COVID and our profit margins are way up. We've gotten a lot more efficient with our marketing. Um, our team's gotten really dialed in. You know, we've had to make some pretty serious pivots and some of the avenues that we had in previous years to get in front of clients are no longer available to us. We can't go exhibit at home shows and, you know, set up demos and displays because those things are just not happening anymore. It's forced us to really look at the business and figure out where do we have opportunity to improve? Where can we change the way we've been doing business? How can we adapt? And, you know, for us, it's, it's resulted in a growing business and a more profitable business. Now, you're not going to have as much control if you, you know, have a fitness franchise or, or a restaurant or doesn't even have to be a franchise, right? I mean, with something like this pandemic, there were regulations at play that literally your business could have been shut down. And that happened to many people. And, you know, it's a little harder to pivot around that. Um, so, I mean, the, the type of business that you're in plays a role in that. But at the end of the day, you maintain a lot more control over all aspects of your life as a business owner. And it's counterintuitive to the way a lot of people think about it. And I have this conversation with people regularly where, you know, they always view business ownership as a much riskier option than working for someone else, you know, where you're going to have a salary, you're going to know how much money is coming in every month, you're going to have the benefits. I mean, most people look at that as a safety net. But in reality, I mean, you're putting all your eggs in one basket, like that, that's the basket of your employer, right? And if something happens, if the, the winds change, or, or something completely outside of your control as an employee happens, I mean, you could be a top performer, your boss loves you, your company loves you, but at the end of the day, the company always has to act with the bottom line in mind. And, and COVID is a perfect example of how, you know, a lot of good employees lost their jobs and, and there was zero that they could do about it. So, uh, I mean, that's, that's probably the, the biggest thing that we've enjoyed uh, as business owners is just maintaining more control over really all aspects of our lives. You ever miss just being able to come home after a day of work and not have to think about it again till nine o'clock in the morning. Is there ever a part of you that wishes like, man, I just, just wish, you know, I could take a mental break for, for the next 12 to 13 hours. Yeah. Yeah. There's some of that. I mean, no doubt. I mean, there's, there's pros and cons to business ownership, right? I mean, the cons, some of the cons are that it, it is hard to turn it off. Uh, you know, we, 
right now we just bought a location, but we haven't moved into it yet. So, I mean, we've been running all of our businesses from home. So it can even be sometimes hard to draw that line between, all right, when are we working and when are we not working? Um, yeah, I mean, the jobs I had in the past, not all of them, but a lot of them, you know, I was still doing work at night and, and, you know, my compensation was based off of my production, right? So the more you put into it, the more money you stand to make. So, you know, I, I've kind of always, even as an employee, I guess, had a little bit of trouble turning it off. So that piece of it doesn't bother me so much. What I try to do is just, uh, you know, set my businesses up and, and really just set my day to day up so that it's enjoyable. Right. And, and I've talked about this on the mindset Monday episodes, like I don't dread Mondays anymore. Uh, you know, I usually am kind of looking forward to it because, you know, I work from home. I, you know, do my workouts at home, right? Like last night I had a call at 8 30 PM with some folks I'm working with out in California. So, you know, I, I worked out at two o'clock yesterday afternoon. Right. So uh, we've kind of figured out how to, I guess, mesh life and work so that, you know, it's not like a nine to five type deal, right? There's plenty of nights where you're working, but there's also plenty of, you know, work day afternoons where, you know, we're hanging out with our daughter, or we're taking the boat out. I mean, we've just, we've figured out, I guess, how to kind of have what, what we feel is a good balance, right? It means you're, you're all, I mean, you're always going to be thinking about your businesses uh, or your business as a business owner. It, it is very hard to turn it off and that can be stressful, no doubt. Um, but, you know, I think as long as you're able to incorporate into that um, the, the things that you want to be able to do in your life, then, I mean, for me, I would prefer that versus having to be in an office eight hours a day. And then, yeah, I get to come home at night and turn it off, but I'm also probably miserable and exhausted. And so all I'm going to do is sit on the couch and watch Netflix in all likelihood. And I say that because that was, that was me, you know, like six years ago. Yeah. Plus the... I give myself a two hour lunch break a lot of days. So I mean, yeah, I mean, it's your schedule, are, right? Yeah. I mean, you do what you need to do to get your stuff done in a day, but it, it can be done on your own terms. And in most cases, I mean, it doesn't, you know, you have clients that you work with in your business. I mean, I have, I have appointments that I have to set, right. And there's plenty of days where I'm like, damn, I wish you didn't have an appointment right now, but I got to do what I got to do. But at the end of the day, you have a lot more control over that schedule, right? So you need to take a two hour lunch break. Great. You know, tomorrow we're going to have 80 something degree weather here in, uh, in Wilmington in October. We've already talked about it. Nothing scheduled for work afternoon. We're going to try to get the boat out in the water, you know, at least one more time this year while the weather's good. So you just, you maintain a little more control. We've personally enjoyed that. There's some people that, you know, kind of need the structure that a nine to five job and, and working from an office provides. And, and that's perfectly fine. Um, said this so many times on the podcast, business ownership's not for everyone. Um, and, you know, the world needs employees and there's absolutely nothing wrong with being happy and content being employee, an employee, right? It's, it, to me, it's just all about figuring out, you know, how can you make a living and create the type of life that you want and do so in a manner to where you're actually enjoying your life and you're not miserable. And, and that's what bothers me you know, when I talk to so many people that are literally, you know, I talk to someone that's been 45 years in a career that they will just flat out tell you they hate it. And I'm like, then do something about it. Why would you put yourself through that? Life is short. You never know when your life could end. Why would you spend so much of it doing something that not only doesn't make you happy, it actually detracts from your happiness you know, it actively (laughs) makes you miserable. So I don't know, that's, that's what we're looking for. It's, it's different for everyone though, right? I mean, it's, you know, what works for me is not necessarily what, what would be ideal for someone else. But that's kind of the central question. I think that a lot of people have right now, how can you provide for yourself, make up, make a living and have that level of freedom that I think is pretty desirable. And that I think is what you try to do with path to freedom not just the podcast, but the consulting in general. So you're working in the business development side at Shelf Genie. You've become fascinated with franchising. So now you decide to leave that job to start the consulting business that you have now. How did you make that decision? And 
what ultimately, I guess, uh, do you hope to accomplish with your consulting business? Yeah, really good question. So there's, I guess, three, three prongs to the decision to leave my job at Shelf Genie's corporate office and start the consulting business. The first was, you know, we, we'd gotten a taste of business ownership through owning our Shelf Genie franchise. And so while I had a good gig, I worked from home, uh, made good money. You know, a lot of the things we just talked about, I had a, certainly a lot more control over my schedule than, you know, I did when I was working in an office uh, 40 hours a week. But at the end of the day, I was still working for someone. And, you know, my boss was awesome, Andy Pittman. He's been on the podcast. Love him. He's a good friend of mine now. Learned a lot from him. But I, I just kind of had this drive to to get out and do something on my own. I think it, a lot of it goes back to what I talked about earlier. If it's just for me, at least it's, it's a lot easier to be passionate about something that I know I'm building for me versus building for someone else. And, and I love my job at Shelf Genie and obviously believe in the business we've invested in ourselves. But I just kind of felt it was time uh, for me to kind of step out on our own It put our family uh, completely independent. We weren't relying on an employer once I left uh, that position. Uh, the second piece of it was strategically you know, our shelf genie business was going good. We were getting into this closet business and, you know, we knew that a big part of our long-term strategy was to keep adding complementary businesses in the areas that we're already doing business, meaning like the geographic areas that we're already doing business. So as a franchise consultant, that has now put me in a position where I kind of have an inside track into what other franchise opportunities are out there and which ones may be a good fit for, for us to get involved in ourselves as franchisees. And our, our strategy is not necessarily to only get involved in franchise businesses. Um, we have a garage organization business, very small right now compared to Shelf Genie and the closet business, but it's also still relatively new. Uh, complimentary goes hand in hand with what we do in those two businesses, but that's a dealership model. We didn't pay a franchise fee. We just, you know, kind of got set up as dealers with the manufacturer of these products. So I'm not saying that like franchising is the only way, but we like franchising because it gives you the ability to run much faster, uh, with the business. You decrease the learning curve, you expedite the ramp up, you benefit from the systems and processes. You know, a good franchise is probably going to give you uh, lower cost. Um, you just get a lot of support. And so we, we like the franchise model. It's worked for us. I've seen it work for so many other people. So part of the decision was put myself in a position as a franchise consultant where, you know, I am building my own business. I've got more freedom and flexibility, uncapped earning potential, but at the same time have kind of access to information that, you know, the everyday person, that might be interested in investigating a franchise is not going to have. And, and it's been kind of cool that that has already kind of started to transpire that piece of the strategy with this uh, newest insulation franchise that, that we're getting involved in. I don't know that that would have ever come on my radar if, if I wasn't consulting myself or at least, you know, working with a franchise consultant, like, like what I do. And then the third piece of it was, you know, wanting to help people, explore options for themselves. Um, when I was doing that for Shelf Genie and uh, 101 Mobility was the, the first franchise company. I don't know if I ever mentioned the name of the company. Um, those were great businesses, right? And it was a lot of fun for me to help people understand those businesses and figure out if they could be a good fit for them, but it wasn't a good fit for everyone, right? So I'd meet some great people and it would just become clear for one reason or another that the business I was representing was not a good fit for them. And that was the end of the road in terms of my ability to help them, right? So now as a consultant, I'm able to really get to know someone and understand what's important to them. What are they looking to accomplish through business ownership? And then I'm able to help them explore a variety of options until we find one that's, you know, the right fit for them. So it just, I feel like it gives, it puts me in a better position to help people. And, and it, I know, I know it sounds corny, right? Because this is a business for me, right? Like I, I make money doing this, but it's a free service to the people that I work with. And 
uh, in, in many cases, I'm really able to help them uh, get into business for themselves with a great franchise and, you know, kind of start charting their own path to freedom. So it sounds corny, like, oh, I do it because I want to help people. But I mean, there's, there's, for me, there's some of that for sure, because, you know, I got super lucky with some of the the mentors that I've had over the years and some of the people that, you know, have really kind of helped me start charting my own entrepreneurial path. And so I do look at this as a way that I can, you know, kind of give back in a way, I guess, and, and help other people um, learn some of the same things that I was, was lucky to learn at, at a pretty early point in my career. Um, so that, I guess those are kind of like the three, three key uh, reasons that I decided to make that transition. And as part of that, as part of a way of helping other people, you've also got this podcast um, yeah. and, and you're, and you're bringing on people who aren't just in franchising, but have all manner of uh, self-employment and that, that freedom you've talked about. When you first started this podcast, what was your vision for it? And how did you anticipate being able to use podcasting to connect with other people? Yeah. Um, I mean, really the, the vision for the podcast was to, to kind of create a platform where people that, that have this, this kind of itch or this drive to get into business for themselves can hear from other successful entrepreneurs and learn from them. Uh, because I, like I've been there, man, I used to, you know, really lose a lot of sleep and just, I, I was, I remember just being frustrated for at least a year, like knowing that what I was doing right then and there was not what I wanted to do. And I wasn't hitting my full potential. And I kind of knew like, you know, I want to get out on my own and do my own thing, but I didn't really know, you know, how to go about that. And I just know that there's a lot of people in similar situations, you know, they, they know that they don't want to work for someone else forever, but they have no clue where to get started. Right. But, and, and for the record, Stuart, you've been very instrumental in making this podcast become a reality. You know, we talked a lot about it before we ever started recording or, or launched the podcast. And I, you know, I think we had this conversation several times while my business and most of my experience is in franchising. I realized that franchising is not the only way to get into business for yourself. I mean, you came on the podcast and talked about, you know, how you've been able to turn freelancing into, you know, your own business. There's a lot of ways that someone could get into business for themselves. Franchising is not the only way. And for some people, it's probably not even the best way to go about it. So I, I think I was pretty intentional at the beginning with the podcast to say, you know, I don't want it to be all about franchising. And obviously, for people that have listened to the podcast, franchising is very much a prominent theme of the podcast. And I talk a lot about franchising. I've had a lot of guests come on that are involved in franchising, but I was pretty intentional in that. I wanted to talk to people that are not involved in franchising, but that have still had, you know, massive success as entrepreneurs and are, you know, creating their own freedom in their lives. And so that I really just, you know, help people see different options as to how they can get into business for themselves and, and just give them a little bit of direction. You know, even if it's just taking that first baby step, um, you know, in the direction of getting into business for themselves, if that's something that they want to do. Again, you know, this podcast is not for everyone, just like business ownership's not for everyone, but for those people. And there's a lot of people out there that want to get into business for themselves, but they have no clue how to get started or, or, or how to go about it. The other reason that I didn't want the podcast to be solely focused on franchising is I also know there's a lot of people out there just like me when I first got introduced to franchising that think it's only food, right? And so because of that, they have never considered owning a franchise as a way for them to get into business for themselves. So in my mind, by it not being a franchise centric podcast or, or, you know, an entirely franchise podcast, I can open it up to a wider audience. People again, that have this desire to get into business for themselves, but probably wouldn't have tuned in to, you know, Wes's franchise podcast, but maybe they'll tune into the path to freedom podcast 
and then they learn a little bit more about franchise and they and they realize hey it's it's a lot more than just fast food and maybe it's not as expensive as i initially thought to get into a franchise and now it's on their radar whether they work with me or go work with someone else or you know find a great franchise on their own you know i i've just seen it so many times where someone never dreamed of owning a franchise business somehow or another they found find themselves owning a franchise business and it changes their life in a, in a great way. So, I mean, that's really what I'm trying to accomplish through the podcast. And then the, the, the final piece of that is it's purely selfish. I mean, I've had an absolute blast putting the podcast together. I love talking to interesting people. I mean, I've met some amazing people that I would have never met before if I didn't have a podcast and I've learned a ton, you know, through it. Um, so there, there's a selfish component too, right? Which is just, it's a way for me to meet really cool, interesting, successful people and, and learn from them. What would you say the most important thing you've learned has been? Ooh, good one. Um, I mean, I'd say it's two things and I, I don't know that it's like a new learning, but it's, it's, uh, it's reiterated it for me and, and really hit it home. I mean, the first one is, uh, just, trust in yourself, right? At the end of the day, you got to believe in yourself if you really want to make things happen. And that's not even just talking about business ownership. I mean, I think that's just solid life advice in general. Um, Not like I didn't know that or hadn't heard that before the podcast, but, um, and I think this came up in one of the recent podcasts. I mean, going back and listening to uh, people answer the, what's the best piece of advice you've ever received question that I always ask. I mean, that's like by far the number one response that, that I get, right, is some variation of believe in yourself, invest in yourself. Uh, so that's really, you know, hit home with me. And then uh, I think the other one is, I mean, the, the Mindset Monday episodes that I'm doing, um, I've explored a lot of topics that that I wasn't as familiar with in terms of, you know, how you can intentionally strengthen and improve your mindset. And, you know, again, kind of circling back to what we talked about in terms of, you know, trying to set your life up so that you can have a happy life and enjoy life and, and live it to the fullest, you know, having the right mindset is, is a huge, huge component of that, right? I mean, if you don't have a, a strong mindset, your chances of being happy on a consistent basis uh, are pretty slim, right? And so just finding different ways and learning from different people about how you can, you know, on a daily basis, work to improve and strengthen your mindset. Um, That's been, that's been pretty cool. I've had a lot of fun with that. And ostensibly, you know, you're trying to connect with other people who might want to get into consulting. So let's just say, you know, whether you meet them through the podcast or other avenues, you get, you get connected with a potential franchisee. Now, what you do from there is you guide them through the entire process. So what, Mm -hmm. what is that process like? I guess at least give us some of the the bullet points there, right? Like how do you, how do you get them connected to the right business? Yeah, it's, it's good to, I guess, kind of have a chance to explain this a little more on the podcast. So, I mean, you know, it's a consulting business for a reason, right? The process is very consultative in nature. Mm -hmm. Uh, The, the high level overview is, you know, I kind of take, take people through a series of consultations, which is all about, you know, me getting clear on what's important to them, right? What are they looking to accomplish through business ownership? What does their ideal kind of business look like? And it's interesting because most people that start the process, they come into it thinking, you know, hey, I'm, I'm an avid golfer, right? I love golf. So I think it'd be amazing to get into a golf business somehow. And what people find out a lot of times is that they would actually be miserable in a golf business. And I'm just using golf as an example, but most people say, I want to find something that plays to, you know, a passion or an interest or a hobby of mine. Wouldn't it be fun to be in in a business that revolves around that? And and really in my experience, the better way to look at it is, you know, I want to find a business that caters to my skill set and also is where my role as the owner on a daily basis is going to give me the quality of life that I'm really looking for. Right. And using Kelly and I as an example, like, you know, if you would have told me six years ago, we don't a custom shelving business, I would have 
laughed in your face, right? What do I know about shelving? You know, I'm, I'm like the least handy person you'll ever meet. But, you know, what we understood was that that's not, it's not our role as the, the business owners, right? I mean, we've got people that build the shelving for us. We've got people that install it. We've got people that go out and sell it for us. You know, our role and really Kelly's role in that business is to be the CEO of the business, but it gives us the quality of life that we were looking for, right? It was a home-based business. Kelly had a lot more flexibility in her schedule. So, you know, when our daughter was born, she was able to spend, you know, a lot more time at home with her while building this business. So what I really try to get clear on with people as I take them through these consultations is, you know, what do you want your kind of day-to-day -day life to look like, you know, as a business owner, what are your strengths? What are your skill sets? What do you enjoy doing? What do you not enjoy doing? And, you know, also, of course, we got to get clear on short-term and long-term visions and, you know, what does that look like from an income standpoint? Uh, we've got to take into consideration, you know, how much capital do you have? We've got to make sure there's a funding strategy in place. And then, of course, that kind of dictates some of the options we could look at in terms of franchise businesses based on what type of investment range is going to make sense for someone. So through all of this, these consultations, I'm able to really get to know someone that I'm working with. And to me, that's, that's the biggest part of this, right? Because, you know, I'll get on the phone for the first time with someone and they'll be like, all right, so what's, what's the best franchise out there? What franchise should I buy? And I'm like, that's such a loaded, like broad question. Like there is no one best franchise. Like what's a good franchise for you could be a terrible franchise for me. It's a very personalized thing. So, you know, this process for me is all about really getting to know the people that I'm working with so that I can understand all of these things. And then I'm in a position to add value. Then I'm in a position to go out and find franchise businesses that strongly align with everything I've learned about the person that I'm working with. And for me to do this and to do it with confidence, meaning, you know, I got to feel good that if I introduce someone to a franchise company that you know, as long as they do the work and do what they're supposed to do as a franchisee, they're going to have a very high likelihood of success. I mean, franchising is like anything in life. There's good franchises, there's bad franchises, there's everything in between, meaning there are franchises out there that I would never, ever consider introducing someone to because I just don't have confidence that they're legitimately good business opportunities, right? So a big part of what I do is, get to know franchise companies, research them, validate them, make sure that if I do introduce someone to this company, and again, if they do the work on their part, then the likelihood of success is very, very high. So as I get to know people, kind of the, the consultation portion of the process culminates in what I call a personal business model, right? So we create a personal business model. And then part of my job is to understand these different franchises and their business models and what type of franchise owners are they looking for? Who typically is a good fit as a franchisee in these different businesses? So once I have a personal business model for someone, I can then match them up with franchise companies that strongly align with, with their personal business model. And then from there, I'm, I'm more of a coach, right? I introduce someone to a franchise company, I'll explain to them why I think it's a good fit and why it's worth their time to uh, investigate that franchise business further. But then they work with someone from the franchise company, someone that's in the role that I was previously at with Shelf Genie or 101 Mobility. And that person's going to have a due diligence process that they take them through. And, and I'm kind of a coach, right? I'm just there to, you know, help them navigate that process, help them get the information they need, get answers to their questions, make sure they're looking at the different angles that they should be looking at. In a lot of cases, I'm just kind of a sounding board uh, for people. Hey, what do you like about this one? What do you not like about it? Um, and, and the perfect franchise doesn't exist. So in some cases, you know, people learn a lot about themselves as they go through this process. They learn what's really most important to them in a business and what's not as important because like so many other things in life, it's kind of weighing pros and cons. Well, this business model has this, this one doesn't, but this one over here has this and this one doesn't, which one do I put more, more weight on? What's going to be more important to me? Um, so just kind of coaching people through that process. And then ultimately 
not making decisions for them. That's not my responsibility. I can't tell you, yes, buy this franchise or don't buy this franchise or you should do it. But most people, because we're all human, you know, you get to kind of the end of this process. You've done all the research. You've learned everything you need to do. And, and you know, even if you feel very, very confident, this is the, the best franchise for me. I have no doubt I can be successful. I love the company. I love the team behind the company. I think it's going to give me the quality of life that I want everyone freezes there for a minute. I call it the oh shit moment. Everyone has the nerves, the butterflies, you know, the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And so in a lot of cases, it's just kind of helping people talk through that and look at it in, you know, more of a, a rational way than, you know, kind of the emotional way that we usually tend to react to fear, uncertainty, and doubt. It's not my job to push people it's not my job to sell anything, but it's my job to make sure that someone doesn't miss out on a good opportunity because they they get nervous right at the end of the process before they, you know, decide to jump. And so really it's just helping people talk through that and and you know look at it in more of a, a rational way. And sometimes people can't get past that. And if they can't, it's not my place to to push them past that. But a lot of times for people that are really serious about changing their lives creating freedom for themselves. You know, it's just having a conversation, stepping back a little bit, helping them realize that these fears that, you know, are, are being conjured up in their mind in most cases are very, very unlikely to, to even play out. And that, you know, the worst case scenario is, is typically not nearly as bad as what, what they initially imagine it to be. So, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the process. And as I mentioned before, you know, one of my favorite things about what I do is this is a free process to the people that I work with, right? So, um, and, and it's the way I do it, at least, it's a no pressure, no obligation process, right? We can move through the process at whatever pace someone is comfortable. Uh, and I just want it to be educational. And the only thing that I ask people that I work with is we got to keep open communication, right? I understand that for most people, coming into this investigative process, it's exploratory, right? Most people, when I start working with them, they're looking at, you know, they're interested in learning about franchises, but they're also maybe looking for a job or looking at some other uh, options to get into business for themselves. And I get that, right? And, and I'm not expecting that everyone I work with decides to buy a franchise. It's not for everyone. All I ask is that, you know, we maintain open communication and, if they get to a point where they really realize that franchise ownership's not the way they want to go or the timing's not right or whatever, just, just tell me. And that way we don't both end up spinning our wheels. And every now and then I have to do the same with someone I'm working with. And I have to say, Hey, I love you, but I don't think you're cut out to be a franchisee, you know, because being successful as a franchisee, you have to be able to follow systems and processes. You have to be able to execute and you can learn a lot about someone through the process that they go through with me. And if they can't follow that process, chances are they're not going to follow the process as well as a franchisee. Um, so every now and then there's a difficult conversation that I have to have with someone I'm working with and just kind of politely say, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable working together anymore because I, I don't think that franchise ownership is the best option for you. Well, you've touched on it a little bit, but quick elevator pitch. Why are you a good coach for this process? I'm a good coach for this process because I'm, I'm living it, right? I mean, and I think I bring a unique perspective. I've worked for franchise oars, right, on the executive side. Uh, we are actively franchisees. And, you know, now I kind of bring this perspective as a consultant. I see a lot of different franchise companies out there. I have a pretty good sense of, you know, what to look for you know, any red flags that you'd want to identify. And I also just really understand the best way to approach finding a business, which again is counterintuitive for, for most people. And so I'm able to save people a lot of time, a lot of headache. I'm, I'm able to take what would be a very overwhelming process for most people and, and provide a methodical approach. And in many cases, I'm able to help people find franchise opportunities that they very likely would have never found on their own, you know, doing research online. So I don't know if that was an elevator pitch. Maybe if we were going up five or six stories, that's an elevator pitch. 
Yeah, we were going up to the to the C-suite. Going, or going up to the penthouse. Yeah. yeah. Well, awesome. So now you know this part pretty well because you designed this part of the podcast, but it's the time, it's time now for the lightning round. So you know the drill. So we'll just start at the top. What's the best advice you've ever received? I guess I probably should have spent some time actually preparing for this because I'm not used to being on on this side of the table uh, for these questions. And this is a hard one because I'm very fortunate. I've been given so much good advice over my life. And uh, sometimes I'm smart enough to take that advice. Other times I have to learn the hard way. Um, I mean, I already, I already hit on, you know, one of my biggest takeaways being that just invest in yourself, right? Um, I mean, I, I think the biggest piece of advice that I've ever received is just simply don't overthink. Uh, if you overthink, you're never going to do anything and you're never going to accomplish anything. And so, you know, make smart decisions, gather as much information as you can, but at some point, you got to trust your gut. You got to take a leap. As I like to say here on the podcast, you got to drop in. Um, and so I, I think that's probably the biggest piece of advice is, you know, make smart decisions, but the worst thing you can do is, is not make a decision and not take action. Morning routine. What's that like for you? Uh, yeah. When it, when I'm doing it good, it's, uh, you know, wake up before my wife and daughter wake up. Um, simply so I can have some, some quiet time. Right. And, and again, when I'm, when I'm really being disciplined with this, I'm not looking at my phone, I'm not checking emails. Uh, you know, I usually like to put like some, it's going to sound stupid, but, uh, like some classical music on in the background, just, you know, some non lyrical, uh, music. And then, you know, I have a journal. I think I've talked about the, the five minute journal, uh, that I, I like to use, um, in the morning. So that's, you know, just simply taking some time to sit down and actually write out things that I'm thankful for and things that I should be appreciative in, in my life. Um, and then I like to write out my goals. Um, and I don't necessarily write them every morning, but I'll, I'll at least sit down and write out every quarter, write out my goals. And I do short term and long term goals, usually going all the way out to like 25 years. And so at least every morning, I like to sit down and read over those. And, you know, I, I think it's good. I've talked a little bit about the power of visualization on the podcast. I really believe there's something to that. Not that it's like magic or woo woo, but when it's, when you're keeping your goals top of mind, then your subconscious goes to work and you start identifying opportunities that you may have not noticed otherwise. Um, there's a lot more I could say about that, but, uh, so, you know, kind of reviewing my goals and then uh, I haven't been doing very good at this lately, but I've actually found that you know, 10 to 15 minutes of meditation is very helpful and not in like a, you know, cross my legs, you know, Buddhist kind of meditation for me, it's, it's a way to uh, kind of prime your mind to stay focused throughout the day. Right. Because the, the type of meditation I would typically do is just simply sit and focus on your breathing. And when your mind wanders and it, it will inevitably wander, catch yourself wandering and then refocus on your breath. And it's amazing to me what 10 to 15 minutes of that in the morning will do for me for the rest of the day, right? Because especially with technology, there's no shortage of interruptions throughout the day, right? And it can really derail you and keep you from doing what you want to get done in a day. And so that kind of practice to notice when you're distracted and then recenter, uh, it, it really carries on throughout the rest of the day. And, and I can definitely tell a difference in you know, days where I do meditate in the morning and, and days that I don't. Um, and then, you know, if, uh, if I'm really being disciplined, then I'll even try to read for, you know, 15 or 20 minutes again. And then, and then I want to be done with all that by the time, you know, my daughter's waking up so I can hang out with her, spend some time with her in the morning. Um, don't really eat breakfast. Uh, so that's not really a, a piece of the morning routine, but you know, for me, it's about having like some quiet time before, you know, the distractions of the day kick in before the phone starts ringing, before the emails start chirping. Um, and, and when I do that, it, it gives me a lot more uh, structure for my day. And I, I certainly perform better. And it's, it's why I like to ask that question, everyone on the podcast, because, you know, successful people all have something that they try to do every morning to, to prime themselves for a successful day. Looks different for different people, but 
Uh, it's something I kind of nerd out on. You mentioned reading. What are you reading right now? Right now, I'm reading a book called uh, Doesn't Hurt to Ask uh, by Trey Gowdy. Uh, I believe he's a congressman from South Carolina, but most of what he talks about in the book is from his days as a prosecuting attorney. Um, so pretty interesting, just about the power of asking questions and then listening. Um, pretty, pretty interesting book so far. Former congressman, if I'm not mistaken. I think he's yeah, retired. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Former congressman, and, and he was a prosecuting attorney mm-hmm. um, before that in South Carolina. But it's a good book. What's your definition of freedom? Because I know you help a lot of other people achieve it, and you probably touched on it at the top of the podcast. But if you had to parse it down to like a quick phrase, what would you say your definition of freedom is? And then, of course, are you living it right now? Yeah, this this probably won't be too different from what I know some other people have said on the podcast. But I mean, for me, it's about being able to wake up every day and having nothing to do other than manage me and everything that we have going on in our lives, not having someone to answer to, um, just having the, the freedom. I don't know if you can use freedom in the definition of freedom, but you know, having the ability to spend your time on things that you want to spend your time on. And again, it doesn't mean you're not going to have, you know, meetings or, or obligations, you know, on a daily basis that you'd prefer not to do, but grand scheme of things, what you're spending the majority of your time working on are things that you've chosen to work on. Doesn't mean you're not working hard. It means you're working hard, but on your own terms. Um, of course, while making sure you're still a good human being and treating people the right way and, and all of those things, right? Um, in terms of am I living it? Yeah, I think so. But I also think it's the type of thing that you never you never like a hundred percent get there. Um, I mean, I, you know, if I look at my life now compared to six, seven years ago, way more living it than, than I was back then. I really didn't have any freedom six or seven years ago in, in the way that we're talking about it today. Uh, but I think it's, you know, for most people, it's, it's kind of a constant pursuit. You're always looking to get better and, and kind of, you know, keep improving, your life. Um, so I don't know that it's like the type of thing where there's a finish line necessarily that you cross and then you're done. Uh, it's at least it's not the way I think about it. You know, I'm always looking to, um, you know, create a better and better life for myself and for my family. Well, Wes, this was very informative. Hope other people feel the same way. Yeah, I hope so too. This was fun. I, I think this was kind of a, a cool idea to turn the tables a little bit and appreciate you uh, taking time to do this. And more importantly, you know, appreciate you helping me out with the podcast the way that you have. Uh, this would have probably never even become a reality without uh, all the help and support from you. So appreciate it. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, people will tune in and get a lot of value from it. Right on, man. Now you're supposed to say, go drop in. Oh, yeah. Well, go drop in.